The following podcast contains advertisements. If you prefer a podcast without advertisements, you can sign up for our ad-free version at patreon.com slash lawfare. That's patreon.com slash lawfare. You'll get rid of the ads and we'll be very grateful. The signal when it leaves the Zamyad, the, the vehicle, the pickup, and goes to the satellite and down to the war room, this takes 0.8 seconds. Then, of course, the sniper, even you know the most skilled one, has to take or will take some time to digest what he sees on the monitor and reach a conclusion and order the joystick, what to do next. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 29th, 2021. Ronan Bergman is a reporter for the New York Times. He is the author of the book Rise and Kill First, which is a history of Israeli targeted killings. And most recently with Farnaz Fasihi, he is the author of a lengthy New York Times investigative report entitled The Scientist and the AI-Assisted Remote Control Killing Machine, which is the story of the use of a ground-based robotic machine gun to kill an Iranian nuclear scientist. He joined me from Tel Aviv in the Virtual Jungle studio to talk about the assassination of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, the operation and the machine through which it was conducted, the larger policy of Israeli assassinations of Iranian nuclear scientists, and the legal bases on which these are done. It's a heck of a story, it's a heck of an issue, and it's a new frontier in targeted killing. It's the Lawfare Podcast, September 29th, Ronan Bergman on the AI-assisted remote control killing machine. So I want to start with the story you and your co-author wrote on the assassination of the head of the Iranian nuclear program, because quite separately from everything else, it seems to mark a change in the way targeted killings can be conducted. To your knowledge, is this the first time any country has used a remote control robotic gun assisted by artificial intelligence to conduct a targeted killing? Hi, Ben. Yes. In uh, the short answer is yes, as far as we know. This is the, of course, excluding the version of uh, the Jackal, where uh, I think uh, they used uh, the same kind of weapon. I'm just joking, of course, this was a fictional movie. But uh, I think this is the first state-run assassination, or as far as I know, any assassination that used this kind of weapon, and used that kind of weapon not just in the sense of not having humans not having operatives on the scene and using remote control robot killer, but also positioning the command room many, many, many hundreds of miles away, something that created, and maybe we should talk about this a little later, created another set of, um, of difficulties. And so after that happened, my great colleague and friend, Fanas Fasihi, and our colleagues from Washington, Adam Goldman, Eric Schmidt, and uh, uh, Julian Barnes, uh, started to collect the reporting, which 10 months after enabled us to publish this story at the New York Times last week. So I'm interested in the sort of your sense of it as a philosophical innovation, because we've been, the United States and Israel alike, have been killing people from standoff robotic platforms for a long time. Uh, Drones. Drones, they are assisted by all sorts of algorithms 
as well as ultimately controlled by humans. The algorithms allow them to fly independently, to take all kinds of sensor measurements, et cetera. And so what does it matter that this one is ground-based and a gun rather than a flying robot? So, yes, you you could say, well, what's the what's the new modus operandi here? It is just a land drone. But it's everything but similar. Israel is using drones for targeted killings in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip uh, that are stationed on its uh, southern and eastern border. And did that quite frequently and does it from time to time today as well. But the people in Gaza, I used to see Israeli drones as much as they used to see the sun or the moon. If a drone will start a voyage from Israel, and it needs to be quite a big one, Israel to Iran, there is a high probability that it will be taken down by the anti aircraft defense systems, the Russians one that Iran uses, that's one. And second, if a drone started to patrol over the this uh, quite deserted aerial area above Absar, this is the village uh, nearby the assassination took place, then probably the Iranians will figure out that uh, something is happening there and got suspicion that someone is maybe planning to kill the person who is traveling through those uh, roads every Friday. And another thing, not less important from the point of view of the planners, and this is collateral damage, the ability to control or to minimize the risk for collateral damage from aerial strike, as we just unfortunately saw in Afghanistan not long ago, that ability is very limited. While From ground, the chances to be accurate and hit only the target that was uh, designated for this uh, operation, uh, those chances are much higher. And, you know, here is the the proof is in the pudding. Only Mr. Fakhrizadeh was killed, uh, not his bodyguard, guards, and not his wife, who sat just inches away from him, and not even the stray dog that uh, coincidentally got into the, the line of fire. And I think this was a... When when this operation was planned, it was very, very important for those who planned that to have zero collateral damage. It is one thing to bomb a building where a terrorist is trying to hide in with sometimes unfortunate and tragic collateral damage. This is by itself... Uh, severe result, uh, some would say illegal. But when you deal with a target that, as they uh, they use the the, the coin, the, the terminology in, in Hebrew, has blood on his hand, or, or in that case, did not have blood on his hand. So to, it means that a terrorist was involved in the killing of people. When you kill a scientist which is who is part of a sovereign scientific project of a sovereign government, I think that the, the, the aim was at least to make sure that only he is killed. Okay, so let's talk about, uh, I want to come back to the issue of, the broader issue of, of killing non-combatant Iranian scientists, but let's start with the nature of the operation. Uh, You have in the story a remarkable amount of detail about the the weapon in question. Tell us about the weapon. Yeah, well, the weapon was designed, the robot was built in order to overcome the obstacles that uh, for a long time made this operation impossible from the point of view of the the operatives, from the point of view of... um, of Israeli Mossad, the Israeli Foreign Intelligence Service. Israel had assassinated few Iranian nuclear scientists. Some were killed, some were injured. And another uh, high-ranked general at the Revolutionary Guard in charge of the R&D of missiles was also killed together with 16 of his, uh, of his soldiers. 
Most of those assassinations took place when a, an operative sitting on a motorcycle was riding it next to the car of the scientist, usually in the streets of Tehran, and either stick a, had a, like a sort of a small sticky bomb attached to the car, which he detonated shortly after when he got a little bit uh, further away, or pulled the gun and killed the, the scientist. The Iranians learned the lesson. They figured out that their number one scientist, Muhsin Fakhri Zadeh, who was running the nuclear project, is probably, uh, will be probably, the next target. And they have made him one of the most guarded, if not the most guarded person in, in Iran. And they, the whole structure, the whole envelope of the security details, a convoy of armored cars from four to seven vehicles, the best revolutionary guard security personnel, trained, heavily armed. Everything was planned in order to make sure that even if a motorcycle is, for whatever reason, successful in getting close to this convoy, he will not get away from there alive. In Mossad, there is an ironclad rule. The same weight is attributed to the success of the operation and the success of the evacuation of the team. If there is no safe way to evacuate, then there's no operation. And it was clear that in any kind of scenario, either with a motorcycle or exploding a bomb on the road that would stop the convoy and then start hitting the cars or the car of Fakhri Zadeh with snipers, any kind of of that scenario would end up in a, in a gunfight and a gunfight that, that nobody can predict how will end. So the question of the problem that gave birth to the robot was how to perform the assassination but make sure that there are no assassins, there are no operatives around the scene because if they are, they are going to uh, get in that uh, gunfight. And then the robot was planned, and the robot was planned in order to take the human factor out of the decision-making process of approving the operation. Once there is no risk to the operatives, then the whole decision-making process looks different. The robot is built, weights all the components together, something like one ton. It is composed of 762 millimeter FN machine gun, special version for snipers. That machine gun is attached to a sophisticated, complex system of computers, hydraulic wheels, cameras that covers not just the front of the uh, of the robot, of course, uh, where the, the gun is pointed out, but 30, 160 degrees, sees everything around in order to try and prevent collateral damage. And the equipment needed to uh, encrypt the signal and send it to the satellite and get, get the signal back. This was disassembled to its smallest parts and through almost a year smuggled into Iran reassembled, recalibrated, synced, and then put on a vehicle uh, called Zamyad. Zamyad is a local manufacturer of uh, Nissan, like a pickup, stash hidden in the back part of the vehicle, of the car, and was placed on the road on the last, after the last turn towards the vacation, the weekend vacation house of Muhsin Fakhri Zadeh, just hours before he arrived there, after he left his, his uh, previous post. So when the operatives learned that he is on, he and the convoy are on their way to Absard, the village, they put the Zamyad, make sure that all the gear is working, connection with the satellite, everything is synch- everything is synchronized, and left the scene. All right. And just to be clear, you started 
this conversation with a quip about the Day of the Jackal, which has a remote control machine gun. And I believe the film was made in the 1960s or 70s. How is this robot different from just a remote control machine gun, I, I, which could have been built at any time from the time a radio was created until, I mean, obviously it's quite sophisticated, but what is the, the sort of specifically robotic component of this that is operating autonomously and what is the remote control element? Yeah. So the first, uh, the remote control machine guns are in use in few, few armies in the world, the, the Israeli, the Russian, the American. This is not new, but the quality of those weapons uh, significantly improved in the last decade because of the, the ability to control and make sure that the shooting is as precise as possible. And uh, this is based on few technologies that did not exist uh, uh, before. But all of that, all of those weapons are operated from a command center that is maybe yards or miles away. That's it. So very, very nearby. And in this case, in the, this assassination, Everything was different. The sniper, the one moving or, or, or maneuvering the, uh, the the machine gun, was sitting in a command room more than 1,000 miles away. The signal, when it leaves the Zamyad, the, the vehicle, the pickup, and goes to the satellite and down to the war room, this takes 0.8 seconds. Then, of course, the sniper, even, you know, the most skilled one has to take or will take some time to digest what he sees on the monitor and reach a conclusion and order the joystick what to do next. Just to be clear, 0.8 seconds is a lot when you're dealing with a fast-moving vehicle yes. at long range. Yeah, so so 0.8 to the command center, some time for the sniper to think, 0.8 to back, so at least two seconds. And then what the, what the machine receives, what the robot receives, is completely not relevant because the car is, is moving. The artificial intelligence of the robot is able to compensate for the loss of time, for those delays, to calculate what and understand what exactly the sniper wishes to hit and calculate the differences in how to move the machine gun and also compensate for the the moving of the machine gun after the first uh, shooting uh, from the recoil this is a very very sophisticated machine of course that was tested many many times and this is the only way how from the point of view of the operatives, this was done successfully, and again, with no collateral damage. So I, I want to emphasize this latter point on the recoil. When you fire a gun, any gun, there is some degree of, of recoil that in a normal situation, a human has to then compensate for by the time, you know, stabilize the weapon uh, in time to take a second shot. Uh, in this case, the human can't do that because he's a thousand miles away. So in addition to compensating for the time lag, the machine is compensating for recoil in what turned out to be a rapid fire of 15 rounds. Is that right? Yes. And um, usually in the places where armies are using automatic uh, machine guns, they are rooted to the ground in something by far more significant than a car. It's like a, usually a tower that is uh, less sensitive to recoil than a car, than, you know, whatever it, it weights and how much you uh, try to uh, attach it to the ground, but it still, it, it, it still moves. And all of that had to be calculated into the, the, the building of the robot. And, of course, while at the same time not making it too big or too heavy so the operatives can 
smuggle it into Iran, uh, assemble it, and put it in the in the scene. Let's talk about the target. Unlike Qasem Soleimani, Fakhrizada is not a household name or was not in Iran, although Bibi Netanyahu, uh, when he was prime minister and spoke at the UN, referred to him by name several times, as you guys note in the story. Who was he and why were the Israelis uh, so keen on taking him out? According to Israeli intelligence, and this is corroborated by American intelligence and also by many documents produced by the IAEA, uh, United Nations Agency, and uh, a resolution of the United Nations from 2006 to freeze the assets of Mohsen Fakhrizadeh. So according to all of those entities, Mohsen Fakhrizadeh was running, was the number one nuclear scientist and was running the secret, hidden, denied military path of the Iranian nuclear project. Iran denied, still denying, that it ever had a military angle to its nuclear project, claiming that the only purpose was scientific and uh, for peaceful purposes. I think that there is a consensus, without getting into too many details, there is a consensus in the world today that Iran had a military project headed by Muhsin Fakhrizadeh at least until 2003. In 2018, the Israeli Mossad stole the secret archive of Project Ahmad, which is the code name for this uh, military angle of the nuclear project. This is the Project Ahmad, is the, the one that uh, the late Fakhrizadeh was running. In the folders and hundreds of thousands of uh, documents and disks and uh, other records, there are notes, handwritten notes, and many, many, many imprints of Fakhrizadeh in his writing or his transcripts and uh, orders in the meetings of the, uh, the highest command of the Iranian nuclear project. Uh, my uh, colleague uh, David Sanger and myself uh, three years ago were allowed access to this uh, throve of documents. And the throw of documents uh, was, again, corroborated by the New York Times and by others. And in that, we saw the handwriting of Mr. Fakhrizadeh on documents and giving orders that leave very little space or room for doubts. What is the purpose of that project? What is what Ahmad was doing? Now, there's a, there is a question, there is a in contradiction in uh, views or the analysis of intelligence between Israel that claims that in 2003, Project Ahmad was disassembled just to be reassembled under another name and that Fakhri Zadeh was running the military nuclear project until the day he died on the 27th of November 2020. There are many who do not agree and believe, including in the US, and believe that that part of the project was frozen. Iranians, they say, indeed lied about what happened until 2003 and did not come clean after the signing of the, the JCPOA, the Iran nuclear deal in 2015. But yet, the the danger, I think, those people believe is less critical or less urgent than the one the, the Israelis portray. Whatever view you choose, it's clear that the late Mr. Fakhri Zadeh was taking a profound role in the nuclear and missile projects of Iran. And thanks to the great work of uh, my colleague Farnas, uh, Farnas Fasihi, she was able for the first time to bring Iranian officials for the first time admitting that he was running an illegal network of smuggling of um, equipment for the nuclear and missile project into Iran, equipment that Iran was forbidden from uh, importing, and that he was a a high-ranked commander at the Revolutionary Guard, and that he was 
deeply involved as not just as a scientist, but as the head of those projects. The Iranians, I think today, after he died, are not trying anymore to hide his role, but are trying to create him as yet another myth, so another myth like the late Soleimani. And um, they are bringing out more and more information. And so from the point of view of Israel, following what was termed in um, 1981 as the Begin Doctrine, Menachem Begin was Israeli prime minister back then, and he ordered to it ordered the Israeli, first the Israeli Mossad to try to stop the Iraqi nuclear military project by means of sabotage and assassination. And when that didn't work anymore, he ordered the Israeli Air Force to raid the Tammuz Osirak reactor by Baghdad and destroy it. And Menachem Begin termed that doctrine and said Israel will never allow a country that calls for its destruction to acquire the means to deliver such annihilation. And I think not just Benjamin Netanyahu, any Israeli prime minister was holding the doctrine and will continue to hold it. And the campaign to kill nuclear scientists, which is not the first campaign that the Mossad is uh, executing against nuclear scientists. Uh, uh, There were German scientists working for Egypt in the 60s there were Iraqi scientists in the 70s and now the Iranian scientists. This is all part of an overall, of this overall strategy to do whatever necessary in order to stop what is seen. And I'm not getting into the debate here whether it's true or not, but what is seen by Israel, by Israelis, and this is high on the consensus as an existential threat, as something with the potential to deliver another Holocaust. So you are also the author of a book, uh, which I highly recommend to readers. Uh, The book is called Rise and Kill First, which is a history of Israeli targeted killings. So this story fits into a much longer train of reporting that you've done. You describe in, in this conversation this as a matter of kind of Israeli doctrine since Menachem Begin and and in some ways longer ago than that. But it's also a set of actions that Israel does not formally acknowledge because it is almost certainly in violation of international law. And because, as you point out, these scientists are not generally combatants, although yeah. Fakhrizadeh was apparently a member of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Uh, they're not combatants. This set of operations has a very dubious status under the law of armed conflict. And I'm curious how, I mean, it is con- these operations are conducted by the Mossad, not by the uh, IDF. How are they understood in relation to the law by Israel, which is, among other things, a rule of law society? Yeah. When it came the time to give the book to which I devoted uh, eight years of, more than eight years of my life to to research um, the book that detailed the history of targeted uh, killing uh, as a main weapon by, by Israel, we had all sorts of names uh, suggested. Uh, one of them was, uh, you know, the obvious, License to Kill. But then it turns out that there are 65 different books <laughs> already called License to Kill. So we said, ah, we're not going to be that one. And then someone came with the lame idea, this was me, and I suggested The Art of Assassinations, like The Art of War of Sun Tzu. Uh, this is a this is a really, really, really bad idea. People will think it's like a coaching book and nobody would read it. <laughs> and, then, and then someone who was really privy to read the transcript, the tens of millions of words of transcripts of the interviews I did with 1,000 interviewees. So more than 1,000 interviews because some of them I had to meet a few times. And he said, you know, Ronan, there is one sentence that many of your different interviewees keep on repeating. And of course, they are not synchronized. They don't update each other about 
the, the, this coming interview, but they they do quote the same phrase from the Babylonian Talmud. And the phrase is, "Whoever comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first." Hakam leorgicha, hashkem leorgu. Whoever comes to kill you, rise up and kill him first. And I think this, you know, the, and the fact that those interviews quoted the Babylonian Talmud was not in order to impress me with their knowledge with the uh, Jewish scripture. They, they wanted to show, they wanted to explain to the readers, I'm just, of course, the pipeline, why they have done those operations way beyond enemy lines, very risky to themselves, to others, and of course, very controversial legally and morally because they believe that this was the only possibility. There was no other choice. And now, connecting to your question, I think that the perception in Israel that was generally accepted by the Supreme Court in its dramatic decision in 2006 by then the president of the Supreme Court, uh, Judge Aaron Barak, to term as legal the use of targeted killings in specific cases. But the general view of those is more or less, if to simplify things, of course it's much more difficult or much more complicated, but to simplify things, it's that necessity of self-defense. You walk in in the street, someone is pointing a gun at you, you pull out the gun in order to defend yourself. Now, the U.S. has dealt with that differently. By the way, some of the principles that Aaron Barak, the judge Aaron Barak, termed at that verdict were adopted by the legal consultants of the CIA. But Israel did not adopt the differences that the U.S. has made between assassinations and targeted killings. I remember once giving a speaking engagement, speaking together on on stage with uh, General Michael Hayden, the former head of the NSA and the CIA. And I said something about assassinations. And he said, no, 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 Ronan, we are not performing assassinations. Those are targeted killings. So this is a distinction that Israelis do not make. Yeah. The, for the Israelis, these are just mere words that uh, like, you know, some, some kind of, of uh, a verbal gymnastics that, that was made by lawyers in order to enable the CIA to do what it was not permitted to do after the presidential order in the, in the 70s. But from the point of view, once a person like Fakhri Zadeh is seen as running a project that is clear and present danger to Israel, then according to the Israeli understanding of the law, he is a, is a legitimate target. And I'm not saying it's my view. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to uh, explain the Israeli view. I understood that you are uh, reporting on doctrine here, not endorsing it. But I just want to suggest that the work that the U.S., legal distinction between assassinations and targeted killing does is not limited to uh, verbal gymnastics. It would actually preclude the killing of a scientist because the in the U.S. version of it, the target has to be an operational, uh, legitimate target under the law of war otherwise it would be an assassination which is illegal and so one of the one of the things that the israeli doctrine that you're describing one of the pieces of work that it does is it collapses the distinction between a combatant and a civilian yes. if the person is posing right. a threat through their work is that right yeah it's 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 absolutely right and uh, i would say taking uh, or involving the legal uh, consultants, whether of the Shin Bet, the Domestic Secret Service, or the Mossad, the Foreign Intelligence uh, uh, Agency, or the IDF, their advices are usually at need when 
the discussion is about a nearby targeted killing which will immediately be attributed to Israel. It will be very hard to deny. And the risk, usually those are done by uh, aircrafts or a means that present a, 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 a by far greater danger for collateral, uh, collateral damage. Again, the, from the Israeli point of view, the entity approving the targeted killing, which is the Prime Minister, uh, with the sort of advisory board of some other ministers, after seeing the forum of the heads of the intelligence community, they are looking mainly at the threat posed by the target and the possible outcomes and of course the risk to the operatives as much as there is one, and the, the possible outcomes of, of the assassination. And the differences between a civilian and an illegal combatant that is working or that is operating in a war zone, those are less important. And they are even less important by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, when legislating this, the Supreme Court was speaking about no alternative possibility for arrest Prime Minister authorizing and proportionality. Proportionality is, of course, a very general term. You can put everything into it and and, and uh, analyze it in in a, in any way you uh, you want. We are going to leave it there, Ronan Bergman. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you for inviting me to uh, your podcast. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our audio engineer this episode is the intrepid Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo. You need to do your part to promote the Lawfare Podcast on all the social medias. Leave us a rating review wherever you found us. Buy our merch at thelawfarestore.com. The Lawfare Podcast is edited by Jen Patya Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. If you want to avoid the ads, you can do so by becoming a material supporter of Lawfare on our Patreon page. And as always, thanks for listening. Looking for a new podcast to listen to? Here's what we love courtesy of ACAST Recommends. Hi, I'm Simon Jane, content creator, DJ, writer, now turned podcast host. I'm here with my friend, Donovan Bailey, five-time world champion and Olympic world record holder turned savvy business mogul. Running Things with me, Donovan Bailey, is an open-minded discussion about global topics relevant to the modern human experience. Each episode is intended to offer enriching dialogue that leaves listeners with a deeper understanding of our topics. And hopefully a refreshing new perspective as well. You can find new episodes of Running Things every Thursday wherever you listen to podcasts. Running Things with Donovan Bailey. A cash recommends.